and AI is going to do even more. It's even more powerful than social media. I mean, you know, I described it to my dad when he was saying, you know, what's all this about generative AI? I said, it's the industrial revolution on a on a wider scale, which will happen much faster. It's from going from people working in the fields to working in the factories, and it's going to happen way quicker, and it's going to transform even more of society. Welcome to the Hand On Business Podcast. Where else are you going to come to get tips, tricks, and advice on growing your business? As you know, what people tend to love about this podcast is that it is a place where you can hear real business leaders discussing systems, methodologies, and strategies that they have used to help them catapult growth in their business. So I'm your podcast host, Hakeem Adebi, and I've grown several small businesses to multi-million pound enterprises and noticed that there wasn't really a place that focused on where I was, i.e. growing a small business. All of the content that seemed to be out there was about big business and often just a lot of theory and no practical implementable advice, which is exactly why I set up this podcast. So take a listen, enjoy and start implementing the strategies that you hear on the podcast. Happy listening. You must have been hiding under a rock if you haven't noticed that there is one topic that's dominating business at the moment, and it doesn't really matter what side of business you're in. It's it's really the top of the agenda. Now, what am I talking about? You've probably guessed it, AI. And there's two kind of camps. You know, you've got AI is going to take all our jobs and it should be feared. Uh, and then the second camp is really AI is going to take our performance to the next level and should be loved. I'm somewhere in between the two of those, but I probably gravitate more to number two, but I'm not an expert. So to help me delve deeper into this topic, I'm you like to say I'm joined by Tim Butler, who is the founder and CEO of Innovation Visual. Uh, and he's got more than two decades of experience in sales and marketing and consultancy. And more importantly, Google placed Innovation Visual among the top 30 digital agencies in the UK, something to be very proud of. Now, what I like about Tim is that he helps clients across different industries to gain visibility, helping them uh, improve their revenue generation and optimization. And my favorite thing he does, uh, because it's a focus of mine as well in my consultancy, is he helps to drive ROI. So today's episode is going to be about leveraging AI to improve your digital marketing strategy. So welcome, Tim. Well, thank you very much, Hakeem, for having me on. I'm really uh, pleased to be here today. Let's jump into it. So you've got over two decades of experience in um, marketing and, and in digital and sales. Yeah. So just talk talk a little bit more about, you know, how, your journey in terms of arriving, arriving as a founder of Innovation Visual. Yeah, I mean, uh, I suppose I could I could give away my uh, my mature years by saying my first <laughs> digital business was back in 98. Uh, when myself and a friend, we founded a, a, a company which was selling late availability ski um, chalets online because I'd been living in the French Alps and I'd seen that there at that time, you know, people were finding it hard to shift that chalet availability. And, you know, going from, you know, 98 all the way to where we are now in 2024, I've seen a lot of changes and a lot of evolution in terms of the, um, the digital space. But what's core and what keeps me interested is the problem solving aspect. So, you know, digital marketing is very much about, you know, how do we do things better? How do we fix this? How do we make that better? And I like, I like the fact that it's an intersection between understanding data and understanding human behavior and digital marketing kind of sits in the middle there. Because if you're not good at understanding data, or you're not good at understanding human behavior, you're not going to be good at digital marketing. Thank you very much. And and that's really uh, interesting because I think lots of people would think they're doing digital marketing because actually they don't have to interact so much with humans, um, whereas I think you couldn't be further from the truth. And actually, exactly one of the reasons I love digital is is that data element because, you know, back in 98, as you know, and and beyond that, when you're running marketing campaigns, to get the data you needed was quite a hell of a job. Um, to get understand yeah. your target market and all that sort of good. So, so when you can now 
get platforms that give you all that detail at the push, push of a button. It's something that uh, I absolutely love. So, so before we get in to like AI and how that can help or maybe not so much help um, yeah. uh, and, and, and the benefits of it. So what does, when we talk about AI, what does that mean to you? Because I want to make sure that everybody listening and watching is yeah. on the same page before we dive in. I, I think that um, if you, the, there's different definitions floating around and, and going back to its core, artificial intelligence is machine learning programs that are designed to self-adapt and, and um, effectively they evolve from the data that they're interpreting they're, they're coded to do that and um you know in the simplistic terms it was you know uh get the program to look at five thousand pictures of cats and dogs and decide which one's a cat and which one's a dog and it, and it would evolve its own code to to design the what the best way of identifying those two and so from machine learning is is the core of ai there's obviously the debate about things like the Turing test and how intelligent is intelligence and that kind of thing, which the media pick up on. But I think the reason why, as you said in your introduction, quite rightly, unless you've been hiding under a stone for the past year and a half, you 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 know about AI, is the generative AI now. So this is the AI that creates the AI that creates an image or gives you text and things like that, which is a very different sort of AI than people maybe have been used to or it's been so hidden the machine learning that we've actually been experiencing day to day nobody's known that actually machine learning's driving that um, and so generative AI is is I think the thing that people really want to hear about today on the podcast yeah no I think certainly so so we're talking about generative AI so we, we've established that and and I mean, I said there's two camps, and they're, and they're roughly here, and obviously there's many shades in the middle. But so let's let's pick off the first one because everyone's petrified. Oh my God, I'm in the creative industry. It can create art. It can create copy. It can do copy, etc. So what's your answer to those people who are fearful of AI and they're thinking I'm going to lose my job because people are now just not going to u- utilize me. They're just going to start putting stuff into ChatGPT or whatever else. Um. I'm probably, unfortunately, going to put a downer on it and say they're not far off being right, because <laughs> it, you know, well, the 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 thing is, right, the creative industry is is really interesting, and and I'm not saying everybody's going to lose their jobs, but you have to understand that if artificial intelligence is better than doctors at diagnosing disease and better than better than human lawyers actually providing legal advice it would be quite naive of us to think that artificial intelligence won't be better at quite a few aspects of marketing that said where ai is good is in segments is in is in silos of do this and if you think about where the early ai in marketing was occurring it was things like optimization of ads and things like that analyzing of data very much a a silo job so i think that if you're in the creative industries and you have a relatively silo job that's concerning but if you're in the wider marketing space or creative space where you are understanding and making decisions around should we do this or should we do that then ai can become an opportunity because the people that can understand and steer it are going to become you know more valuable um in terms of the market so it, it is going to be it is going to be transformative and i think that we would be naive to not think it's going to cause really significant changes in uh, in human workforce behavior so so just on that just get just have you got a, a couple of examples of the key ways which you would think that ai is going to change and revolutionize digital marketing strategies okay uh well let's let's take um let's take chat uh, yeah. and and call centers so call call centers used to be the thing and then we started to have chat on websites and there are thousands and thousands of people employed around the globe to man call centers to answer questions and it has been shown that i can interpret this and and, and evolve these human language conversations you know 
I'm sure you've got Alexa or, or you've got a Google Assistant device in your home or an Apple Home device or using Siri. And we're now taking it for granted that we can just ask it questions. But not only that, that it understands the context of what's been said before, because that's that's really where the intelligence piece comes in. So if we're thinking about the marketing roles, well, we used to have people who would design chat flows end to end, you know, giving logical bra branches and things like that. Well, we don't need to custom design chat flows for for clients necessarily now because what we can do is well let's put an, a, an ai powered one in there and it will evolve and it will it will use the data bank that you show it and it will use the you know the the guardrails you put in place and that's it just goes ahead and does it um and then i've even seen you know the the new ai powered phone salesman um you know i've seen a demo of that you know so Again, it's um, it's right there in terms of the 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 human interaction piece with uh, between companies and between their customers. But in the back end, if you like, in the creative industries, image image generation you you spoke about that's a big thing. You know what the time it took a an art worker to cut out round an image of a, on a photo um, neatly in Photoshop and then transpose that to a different background and make it look like it hadn't just been sort of uh, plonked on there artificially. You don't need to spend three hours doing that now because there's a program that does it and it does it instantly. And it's lots of incremental savings like that in areas like artworking and video, which, um, which are going to transform the time taken in those industries and therefore the number of people that you need doing it. So, so just on that, because I mean, I completely concur with everything you're saying, because I use a lot of AI in the videos, in the editing, uh, copywriting, et cetera. Now, again, I don't just take copy and stick it in because yeah. it, it, it is very generic. But in terms of a building block and a starting point, it's really yeah. good. So is there any reason why, bearing in mind there is a huge amount of tools out there that actually can be used for those things, is there any reason why people haven't re we haven't seen that massive job loss yet? Um, because there is certainly, in, as you said, in the art world, the creative world, and I, I know people keep saying, "Oh, you can never replace a human being," which you, we hope you can't. Yeah. But there's certainly tasks and certainly monotonous tasks that people currently do, yeah. where actually you can just put it into an AI engine and it does it. Yeah. I mean, why haven't we seen the job losses? Well, there's there's always inertia in whatever. Um industry is doing and businesses are doing um i come from an economics background and and you know the longer an industry has been working in a certain way often the the, the more it wants to continue down that that route um maybe what we're seeing though here with generative ai i think it's actually more about the fact that we're not people aren't cutting jobs at this point what they're saying is mm. hey i can create this content twice as quickly so i'll create twice as much content and i think that's actually what we're seeing it's not a oh well i can create the content twice as quickly i'll have my workforce people are you know they're saying well i'll just do twice as much and and that then leads to the problem of just noise which is something we should really think about when it comes to the the issue of marketing and and in terms of Currently, because obviously, I mean, I know you work with lots of different clients. Is there any particular country that you think has really embraced it? Because, I mean, just as you were saying there, what you're talking about really there is that actually people should and could uh, use AI to become more productive. But the productivity stats in the UK and different countries are pretty poor. Um. We, I, I'm not sure it's a, a national, I'm not sure I would, single out some certain yeah. nationality of, of doing it more better than others i think what you find in the us is the the venture capital money and the angel funders have, have, have got a better attitude to risk and you're seeing more tools created over there whether they're being adopted i think it's because 
those AI companies, they're going to start in their home market. So they're pushing into the home market. We're working with a, a really interesting AI um, company out of Cincinnati. They're doing some really interesting stuff around specific large language um, stuff for companies which do a lot of R&D and a lot of um, innovation. Um, and they're not even looking at pushing into the UK or the European market at this point because they're early, they want to get the home market. So I think the US is is seeing a lot more in the way of marketing push on these tools. But then you've got some really interesting stuff going on in Europe and there's lots of pockets of innovation. I know a, a, a company that does um, a search for e-commerce. That's all they do is the search bit for e-commerce. And they're building some really interesting stuff into their tools with AI. You know, they're they're working out of um, Lithuania. Um, so you wouldn't see them as, you know, you wouldn't say Lithuania hotbed of AI. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, you've got these pockets of, of innovation of bright people that see the opportunity. All right. Okay. So that's really, really. And then from your point of view, because obviously you're sales and marketing, are there any, is there anything that you're using or that you've seen used? I mean, one of the things we talked about at the, at the top of the, at the top of the uh, program was about uh, driving people's ROI, which obviously is the, uh, yeah. what, what every, every business, <laughs> well, I'm, I, I was going to say wants to do, but what should want to do lots of businesses just focus on turnover, but that's, that's a, a topic for a different discussion. Um, yeah. So, yeah, have you seen things or are you using oh. things that can really help drive that? Yeah, I mean, um, there's, there's so many. I mean, we, we're Innovation Visual. We actually have a, uh entire large section of our knowledge base. We have an internal knowledge base for our team just that we've been plowing so much information about AI tools into I, I hardly use them in comparison to my team, but we've assessed literally well over 100 tools and we've analysed what they do in different areas so that we can bring them to bear um, for our clients and, and internally as well. And um, there are lots of good things out there. What I would say is what's really interesting now is this next kind of step in the AI revolution is the incorporation of AI into existing platforms. So talking of ROI, we're, you know, we're a, a well-respected HubSpot partner, which deal with a lot of complex clients. And HubSpot's bringing these AI tools into different areas of their business. So there's, there's areas um, of the of the HubSpot software now on the content front that does things. Um, and I know you're interested in things like dynamic lead scoring and that kind of thing. And, and, and they've got those tools in there. And it makes a lot of sense if you're talking about like what tools should a business use to adopt AI is where you think about what you're trying to do with it. Where does the data exist? Because remember, it goes back, it's machine learning. If you don't have the data, it can't learn from you. Now, you can use chat GPT all day long because it's learned from a different data set. You don't have to provide it. But if you're talking about doing things like um, lead scoring and using AI to, to have better lead scoring, you need to run that AI against your data set. So if you adopted a brand new tool for lead scoring, you've still got to find where that data sits. You've still got to connect it to the data. So I think the advantage that some of these incumbent softwares have is that they have the client data sets mm -hmm. and they just need to now put this layer the AI over the different areas because they can say, hey, we can run AI now against this. We can do it for forecasting or lead scoring and those kind of things. Okay, so yeah, and that, and that kind of answers one of the questions I was just about to ask because if you're a small business, for example, um you know lots of people are trying to get into ai or do things with ai but what so would your advice be based on needing those data sets and people have already got it to actually jump on to a platform like a hubspot for example that's already doing something rather than developing it yourself in-house i yeah i'd be cautious about developing stuff in-house it seems like a good idea but um if you're a small business the cost of the person or the people that you need to code AI or even connect necessarily to ChatGPT could be really quite expensive. The other mm. thing is, um, 
yes, you have to pay month in, month out for your subscription, but the cost of development is being spread across thousands or millions of users. Therefore, it's going to have a have a lower cost. Um, but what I would say is for, for sort of more small business owners that are looking for growth, think about AI in two ways. It's about being more efficient at what you do or doing what you do better. So think about it in those two ways. So if you're thinking about efficiency, where are you spending time or resource at the moment that you think AI can fix it? So for example, if you create a lot of content, you spend a lot of time thinking about the ideas for that content. Well, maybe you could put it into chat GPT and say, can you give me the ideas or, you know, any of the other like language models to give you content ideas, if that's where a lot of time gets taken, or it might be you spend a lot of time actually writing replies or something like that. Well, okay, can we can we push those people to a, a an AI powered um, chat tool instead? So efficiency. Look at where you can where you're spending a lot of time, and then you'll make the biggest efficiency gains. And then on the improving performance. Think about where, where your performance needs to improve. So don't just go and grab a, a tool, you know, yeah, yeah, quite happy for people to email after this and say, hey, Tim, can you help me sign up to HubSpot? You know, that's great. But, but what I'm saying is that's not necessarily the answer because we don't know what the question is yet. So ask yourself, what's the question? So where, where's the problem that's not maxing out my ROI? Is it the awareness stage? Is it that we have problems converting from proposals? Is it that, you know, uh, we don't have the right product mix on our e-commerce site? So, so I think there's so much out there. You need to take it back. Don't just dive into a tool and expect it to fix something. Think about what you want to have fixed and what the biggest wins that you can do are. Yeah, and no, I think that's very, very sage advice, to be honest. And that's so, I mean... And what's the best example you've seen so far, either in your own business or in other businesses, where you've done exactly that in terms of around performance, where you, you, you've utilized AI to change um, something in your business or in on a client's business? Um, so singular, singular performance changes, I think... Um, what I, what I would say is really interesting, and it's something that maybe quite a few people have seen. I think that um, Google's use of machine learning in its performance max advertising, I think, is a really interesting showcase of performance. I've seen that deliver some very strong results, given that it's basically a, a black box and you don't know what's going on. Similarly, though, I've also seen it poorly set up and poorly configured and then actually spend an awful lot of money. So because it's a black box and, and people don't often know how to get get that set up, um, it can be a bit risky. But I would say the biggest wins on the generative AI side with things like large language models, that's been in generating um, variables for A-B testing and um like different content variations so e you know different emails in nurture workflows different ad texts in in ads been able to do that at scale um that's a real big time saving for people because you can have the human start off by saying okay here's our version one email and then you can put it into a tool and then you you can very rapidly create three or four iterations and then you can put those into test that's a big saving, therefore that's a good ROI. And then I think on the visual side, I think the, 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 there's some real wins now coming through on the visual side in terms of creating graphics that um, would have been very expensive to create otherwise. But it, you know, word of warning, um, there are still, I see some appalling instances where um, people haven't got very good outcomes. You just, you've, got to make sure your quality control is um is even better and look in detail um when you're using any of these tools yeah and i, th I think that's a real um sort of warning <laughs> for people who are going to use it because i think you get lots of people who think all oh, right great i've got AI now ai now i'll just stick it in there and then i'm just whatever comes out 
it must be better than I could do. Whereas, you know, as you said, I think you need you still need to have exactly the same quality control or even more quality control. You may, have, <laughs> if you suggested, than you have if you're using a human because you you would. You wouldn't send something to a copywriter and then not check it and just stick it up, would you? You'd always check it, even yeah. though they're professionals. Yeah, and and I think actually there's a lot of people that don't understand how the the tools work, which is a danger in itself. So the large language models have learned to string together words to make sense in the context of the prompts that they've been given, but they are they are put stringing together words that's what a large language model does they are not researching the internet looking at everything out there and then producing you with an answer they're stringing together words so the 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 new sort of ai powered search responses that bing and google are doing they're, they're very different to a, a chat gpt or a, or a bad lang large language model so you can uh, a good example actually of uh, of a mistake was I heard that the professor of computer science at Newcastle for five pure maths books for undergraduates and the model produced the here's the five books um, for maths undergraduates on pure maths and they had you know very good titles and professor this had written that and doctor so and so had written that they were all five were made up so <laughs> Somebody could have taken that and cut and pasted and gone, oh, well, here's five good books for, for learning pure maths at undergraduate level. It's entirely made up. And there's this thing called AI hallucination that people don't understand. It's stringing words together for you. It's not, it's not researching things. So there's the different types of models are doing different things with data. And if you don't get why where the the origination is you need to you know you need to be cautious using it and there's the other thing is about data sets and bias so another problem um my my wife's a cricketer so she likes to play cricket so i put into one of the uh image generation models create me a, a set of images different variables of a woman uh a, a, a female cricketer bowling right so female crickets are bowling into a into a uh, one of these AI tools. For a start, they're not very good at hands. So the hands hands were a bit messed up. But also it got confused between 10 pin bowling and bowling in cricket. So the bowl <laughs> the balls were bowling balls. There were there were four stumps for the cricket stumps, but interestingly, the um the model returned all of the females were all of an Asian origin because it had obviously seen images before of female cricketers and gone, oh, well, they're, they're almost always Asian, so I'll just make them all Asian. And, and that's an obvious thing that I saw, but we need to be really careful when we're using AI about bias and not just, you know, taking as read what these tools are giving us but actually thinking about the content in front of us that they're giving us definitely and and, and you've mentioned just before that about origination so if you're a lay person how yeah. let's talk a bit more about that how would you understand where that data set is being pulled from because because I, I think you're right i think most yeah. people think that ai is doing millions of um searches to get you the best data and then giving you a, a really comprehensive answer I think um, they're quite opaque. The tools are pretty opaque on, on where they're getting the data. And one of those things is there's a big copyright issue around, um, you know, they're, they're taking all this stuff and then they're creating content that they've learned from other people's content that was a human that owned it. Um, my understanding is that I think uh, there is a, there's a set of artists that have created images independently of each other of what the simpsons would look like if they were human i think that's what it is but if you ask these uh image generation ai tools what the simpsons look like if they were human they all come up with stuff that looks very much like it's just copying somebody else's copyright so the tools aren't telling you where they're getting their learning from but what when it comes to the generation bit, you need to read the stuff around the tool. So 
how often is the tool actually learning? Is it dynamically learning? Because I can't remember, but I think it was back with one of the early chat GPT um, tools, but it its model was 18 months. It said that it hasn't, like the model is 18 months old. So it hadn't got anything from the last 18 months. So if you asked it something about current affairs, it wouldn't have that. Whereas another AI tool might be plowing through, you know, everything that's on the internet currently. And so it'll be fully up to date with whatever happened this morning. So it's just reading and actually understanding as much as you can where they're coming from. And again, thinking a large language model is about stringing the words together, what, you know, what these things do. But I think the, the more and more these tools get embedded within other tools the further away we're going to find ourselves from you know where that originally came from okay thank you very much and and, and earlier on well, right at the beginning we you talked about when we were uh discussing ai to start off with you said it's about understanding data and then linking that to understanding human behavior so what what is it about ai or how is it that ai can really enhance that and be le you know leverage personalization and optimization uh, of customer experiences because that's that's yeah. what people are really trying to move towards isn't it these days uh, so personalization um the foundation of that is the segmentation of your of your data so again we do some really great stuff with clients here using platforms like hubspot and and other platforms where you look at your your data set and you go okay we want to create personalized journeys we want to do that more and more scale so you know uh you could have a i don't know a, in simplistic terms you could have it um people that live in england people that live in other countries that would be a segment um but you actually well i don't want to just do that i want to go really personal so i want to know you know people that live in manchester people that live in Liverpool, people that live in London, right? So the AI in some of these uh, tools can allow you to identify the segments because they're not, they're not as uh, easy, if you like, to identify as Liverpool, Manchester, London. It's actually behaviours. So really what you're um, looking to segment on is things like, I don't know, reads this type of case study or visits this type of page or on an e-commerce site is looking at these type of products visiting these categories and things like that so you've you've got the ai enabling you to dive deeper into data because it can look at much you know far more data points than you or i could look at um, and so then it starts creating these um these segments in the really smart tools, these are becoming very dynamic, almost personalized. You think about the investment that Amazon has done on um, AI and, and Netflix as well. When you look at Netflix and you see all the thumbnails of the films, that's, that's Hakeem's view of Netflix. That's, that's not Tim's, right? It's entirely yeah. personal, same as, same as um, Amazon. For the smaller growth business, you can't go to that level, but you can get tools which can take you some some way towards it. So things like Shopify, there are plugin apps where you can actually get the 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 app to dynamically adjust the site and do this. And then the flip side is, if you're say B two B growth business, you start using the AI to create these segments. Well, going back to what I said about um, content generation, if you gone from having four different segments that you're going to do workflows for and you're going to go to 40 well ai can help you create the other 36 um sets of content which are going to be personalized because you can be smart and say well this is what we want to do so you get that more personal experience because that's you know that gets you uh, gets you customers people like to see what they like straight in front of them, make their life easy. That's what personalization brings to them, makes them feel like they've come to the right place. And in your experience, is there any particular business that's more likely to uh, find a benefit or an elevation in using AI? Or is it more about um, 
just the actual the, the process of marketing and sales and all those things that bring that come along it's that anyone in that who's doing that sort of activity can benefit we've seen it and we've applied it across everything from very niche b2b through to you know consumer products e-commerce and things like that i don't think you can say um there's any one which will be really beneficial but what i would say is if you if the listener is there going well yeah okay i get what that tim's saying but it's not going to work for what i do in marketing it's not going to work for my industry then you're wrong <laughs> it's just <laughs> i'm sorry to say it but it it it's just a set of tools it's like saying a pen won't work because you know we've always used pencils and our industry is very pencil orientated, so we can't possibly use a pen. Well, you know, you start using the pen, you go, oh, right, actually, this this is good. So it's it's just a tool. AI is just a tool. Interesting, because I mean, as I said, at the outset, I use quite a bit of AI, even just in the video editing. You know, this Riverside, and this is not necessarily a plug for Riverside because they're not paying me, but uh, every day I, I, I open it, that there's another tool. So when I first started using it, then it's basically... You did it. You recorded a video, and you may be able to do a bit of editing in there. Now they've got they're, they're producing show notes. So you press a button, it gives you the show notes. It gives you the mark, the time markers, and then there's a yeah. thing called magic clips. So you press a button, and it scours all of what we've just talked about, and then it will take it will yeah. clip them down into headings ready for social media clips. Which you know, yeah. if I if I go back a year ago, two years ago, I was paying somebody. I had to go through it manually identify all the interesting uh, topics and then give it to somebody and say, can you clip this out? Uh, and now yeah. I can do it in like two minutes. Well, less than yeah. two minutes, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, and that, that, yeah. That's answer, and that's answered the question about how is it going to affect jobs? So that person who was doing that video editing, they've, they've probably gone on to do some other type of video editing, but it's going to cascade down. Yeah. And maybe those people coming into the jobs market who wanted to be a video editor, all of a sudden, there's there's not a job there. Yeah, well, well I, mean, I, I suppose my only challenge to that, because I think you're right, but my challenge to that is I've met so many lazy business people. So my my view, I mean, because I, 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 I'm very much hands-on and I like learning new stuff. So I'm always, whenever there's something new, I'm always going to try it out. But there's yeah. lots of people who are like me in small businesses who just think, oh, I don't really want to do that or I don't know how to do it. So, I, so I, when I was looking, I was thinking, that gives a video editor probably an advantage because they can use these tools to do all yeah. of the stuff they used to do a hundred times quicker than they used to do it and yeah, yeah. and potentially make more money and get more clients. That way it was the only way I started thinking yeah. about when I was looking at all these tools. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I would say um, I see, I wouldn't call them lazy business people. I call them efficient with their time. The, yes, that it's really interesting because when you meet some of the really rich ones they don't work very much but when they do they always work on the right things yeah. and therefore they 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 deliver the results that way um but that you know yes it the tools will make you more efficient and so the video editor can make more profit but what will happen over time from an economics basis is more people will come into the market and they'll undercut, and so it will gradually yeah. bring that down. No, yeah, you're right, actually, because on reflection, it's now a hundred times easier to be a video editor than it was before, where it was a it was a really skilled job. You don't need to understand sound mixing, how to you know edit, etc. Whereas now, you press a button, it does it all for you. So any man off the street, or any woman off the street, or anyone off the street yeah. can now say, "Well, let me get hold of Riverside." record somebody and i can give them all their social media clips that they require yeah. without really any skill so yeah <laughs> you are true it's 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 a double edge a double edge sword really uh, so, so if you were if you oh sorry go on no no i was just agreeing with you just agree no, so, yeah i was just going to say so if there was any advice you could give to you know marketers watching this um and they're thinking about well ai actually i've just been listening to this and ai's got a lot of opportunities for me what would be your advice to them in in terms of how they could integrate uh, ai into their yeah, their marketing strategies for the first time if they've not used it at all um yeah, almost like I, a do's and a do's and don'ts i suppose 
I suppose I would I would go back to that thing about um, look at like it's the efficiency and it's the performance. So so as a marketer looking at it for the first time, where am I spending too much time, or where are my team spending too much of my time, uh, their time? Look at that. Look at then what tools sit in that area of of um, utilization and and what they're doing in skills, and then on the performance, you know where where do we feel our competitors are beating us because that's really where performance comes from it's like where are we winning and where are we not winning so well so where are the competitors beating us those are good areas to start the focus um setting up for ai we've talked a bit about segmentation we've talked about personalization and things like that um i would say there's a really important thing about having a data strategy i did a talk over actually in lithuania um last year and it was all about making more profit from your data and the starting point of that talk is you need to put your data into a place where you can access it and we often see with new clients when they come to us that they've got diff disparate stores of data so they've got i don't know they've got something over here in mailchimp they've got something over here in pipe drive or oh we did this stuff with hubspot here and oh we've got some things in hootsuite here and our website's over here doing this and and we've got some analytics and you know they've got data scattered all over the place now if you want to use a machine learning tool to do things like lead scoring or you want to create you know segments which are intelligent and that kind of thing um, or even just understand, you know, what marketing decisions you make lead to better profits, you need to be able to actually understand and join your data up. So a lot of what we do early with clients when they come to us is help them with their technology stack and say, you've got these tools, we need to rationalize this down to a, a, a smaller number of tools, but also connect them together. And And I talk about the fact that what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to see the chain of events from a marketing decision to revenue. And data allows you to do that. And so going back to the, where do you start with the AI? Well, if you want, the, if you want AI to help you generate more revenue and profit, you need to be able to tell it, here's the data that will allow you to see the choices we can make as a as a marketing organization and sales organization to the revenue and and then you can set the ai loose to go hey optimize this find this look at those segments so i think get your data really nice and 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 organized and clean and 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 that's a, a strong starting point for using some of these other tools beyond the the kind of gen ai uh, graphics and uh, efficiency ones, large language and stuff. So yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, so it's about getting your data strategy correct, join it up, and I like that thing you said about seeing the chain of events from a mar your marketing activities, and then linking that through to your to your revenue, which I think uh, is a gap that lots of people have. Uh, which was going to be my next question is: so uh, what what are the real pitfalls? Are the pitfalls just not doing all that? Um, I think there's a there's a danger to to do the get attracted by the shiny object and think it's going to fix the the AI is going to fix something that the problem isn't the AI or something that the AI can fix, but like it's a rubbish product or your messaging is wrong. If you get the AI tool to just create lots of versions of the same message and the message is wrong, then you're not going to get anywhere with it. Um, so from a from a don't expect AI to fix everything. You've got to still be a good marketer and a good business person. Um, but I think the the pitfalls are also um, just creating noise. I think from a marketing viewpoint, people are using the AI tools and they're often creating noise, and they're not thinking about their customer enough. They're not bringing it back to what's my customer want. And does your customer really want a 600 word blog that's been created by 
Bard or Chat GPT about subject X that Bard or Chat GPT said they should have something on? Or do they really want your insights from you? Because why did you start this business in this certain area? You know, they they probably benefit from your expertise. So so think about your customer, your customer journey first, and then how can AI enhance it? Don't just create noise and expect your customer to want to listen to your noise. Yeah, I think um, there's probably a lot of that going on, actually, um, that people are now thinking, oh, I'm a content creator because I've got a, a, an AI generative tool where I can pump out if I, every day if I want. But, yeah, as you said, uh, and I think that's where, you know, when when people are a bit worried about it and sort of say, well, you, can, you can't replace humans, I think that's probably what they're talking about, isn't it, that actually... I want your expertise that you've gathered over 20, 30 years in a specific industry, yeah. which actually AI can get insights into it, but it can't really uh, get what you've been through or all, all of the, the, the learnings that you've been through um, yeah. are difficult to replicate. Yeah, actually, Hakeem, you, you said something absolutely spot on there. It's the, it's the fact that the AI hasn't grown up in the real world. That's... That's where AI doesn't understand stuff. It's not grown up in the real world. It's not been a kid and gone through stages of life and seen the world change and understand that there was a life before the iPhone or whatever it might be. And so it doesn't get the context of human society. And so you need to make sure you're providing, if you're using the AI tools, you're providing the human society context to it. And, and do you see, I mean, and this is everyone talks about the gen, I don't know where we are now, gen X, gen Z, whatever. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think we come back round to A. Um, so do you see, because obviously we've grown up in societies where you didn't have all the technology, then you start getting technology, and then you've now got really advanced technology. And I find personally, when I look at my kids, that I have a richer experience and understanding of all the tools because I have to do everything manually at one point. So I can understand how to really mine those yeah. tools for best benefit rather than just I'm going to use them anyway because I've always had them. Yeah, I think, I think it's probably not, it's not people's fault that they don't necessarily know what goes on under the hood. Mm. Because society, if we don't need to learn something, human nature says we don't do not do it because there's other more exciting things to do. And so I don't know about you, but when I was much younger, I could actually fix a car, right? So I had an <laughs> old car and I, and I could fix it when it went wrong. It had carburettors. I mean, people probably don't even know what carburettors are. <laughs> rather than fuel injection it had carburetors and it had spark plugs and it was very simple right but if you asked me to go outside and fix my car now i'd be like i i actually i struggled the first time i lifted the the bonnet of the new car to find where the battery was because it it comes under a battery cover now and who'd have thought it yeah. um so taking that to the technology and the tools well i i didn't know i haven't learned to fix modern cars because i don't need to so i don't think we can criticize or, or or think about those other generations they're just it's just there it just exists you know why why should they learn i think the problem is if they if things are taken away that they've become over reliant on but now we're kind of getting into more societal questions rather than a sales and marketing sort of ai discussion yeah no certainly i, 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 I think we are um, so just to wrap up, I mean, as a, I always try, we, we talked about it right at the beginning. I try to do like a, almost like a current affairs section just at the end to wrap up to kind of yeah. see, well, in the real world and what's topical around the topic that we're discussing, which is obviously AI. Yeah. So, uh, we were, we were talking about that before. So yeah, we, the, what we started talking about was you know, the, uh, the Senate in the U S uh, and I yeah. don't know if anyone's again, not been paying attention, but the, Social media magnets were <laughs> basically uh, called in to uh, atone or at least explain their behaviour. Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts on that? So it, it's really interesting because governments and regulation haven't really caught up yet with social media. And so 
we've got this Senate hearing and they're they're complaining and stuff and and there's I think I think it's called section or rule twenty seven or so. it's something that it's basically it's the the it's a very old law that came out when the internet literally st first started we were on dial up modems to protect the internet service providers who created the pipes of the internet against being prosecuted for the content of what was on the internet which was moving between their their cables their fiber optics or whatever and this this law still protects effectively social media companies now in terms of um they can just say well it's not we just provide the platform we're not responsible for what somebody wrote on our platform because this law says it's hmm. just it's in the pipe we just provide the pipe you can't do that and and this law is like I don't know, nearly 30 years old, and it hasn't been changed because of, you know, various different lobbying. If you think about that, we all know that there's harms being done with social media, but they're not fixed. And AI is going to do even more. It's even more powerful than social media. I mean, you know, I described it to my dad when he was saying, you know, what's all this about generative AI? I said, it's the industrial revolution on a on a wider scale which will happen much faster it's from going from people working in the fields to working in the factories and it's going to happen way quicker and it's going to transform even more of society so if if the governments can't get regulation of social media as it stands right it's a very bleak outlook for regulating ai because of of what you can do with it yeah no and no, no, no. We said at the beginning it was that that's not that's not the most elevating um, yeah. point on on which to finish. But but it is, I think, what we're saying is that AI can be a force to good for good, and AI can be a force for something other than good, depending on who's wielding it and how it's been regulated and how it's been utilized, just like a hammer, basically. It's a perfect analogy. You can create a beautiful sculpture with a hammer, or you can you know you can do somebody an awful lot of damage in a violent attack with a hammer you know and they're, they're they're poles apart i think the thing that people need to understand with ai on a personal level if we bring it up to the current affairs thing is just question what you see because ai gives us the capabilities of creating things that didn't you know that never happened it's not just yeah. the hallucination of the ai tools but it's the malicious use of creating video i mean you've probably seen the video of the pope wearing his cool clothes yeah. and stuff like that you might have seen the dancing uh dancing celebrity like american politicians um in drag i don't know whether you've seen that video but you know they they were done in a way that you know that you know biden isn't going to um you know dress up in a in a go-go dress or whatever it is but um <laughs> the the thing is it's going to be the subtle stuff like, oh, yeah, look, look at this. This is what your local politician uh, was caught doing, snapping. You know, we've snapped him kissing his secretary. Well, actually, did they? Because mm. they could just take two photos of two people and superimpose them on pictures of, um, you know, two people kissing. And, and would you know? And then the, the industrial creation of content around, you know, misinformation. So it, it is a bit of a downer, but I think as members of society, as humans, we have a obligation to ourselves and to, to those around us to question what we see and to be, uh, I think, looking out for things and calling it out if we think it's, if it's wrong from, you know, AI generated stuff, because we can't necessarily rely on the, the, the regulators. Um, because unfortunately, governments have, have proved themselves to be very slow when it comes to um, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, and I've, there's, there's two things that, that made me concerned. Number one, I've got another video software, and it's got and it's and it's asking me the other day, "Do you want to clone your voice?" And I was thinking, "Oh, that's quite good." Um, but now I'm thinking, hmm, if if I clone my voice, it's, it's it's then in the cloud in their software. I'm sure they've got lots of um, firewalls, etc. But I'm thinking, so that means someone can clone my voice and then start utilizing my 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 voice 
So that's really interesting. So have you read the small print to see whether they will then own your voice or own the rights to your voice? Because what a lot of people who do DNA tests don't realize is when they read the small print, you're allowing that company then to have your DNA and mm. do a variety of other things with it. And somebody was saying that they, they've done DNA tests quite a few years apart with the same company. And actually the results of their heritage came back differently because <laughs> all the time the database is being updated with all the new people's DNA. So they're then like reinterpreting results effectively. But you could, you could, you know, put your voice into the cloud to, oh, this is great. I can clone my voice. And you could find actually that then there's TV adverts with you as the voiceover, but you don't get any money for that because you've signed away the waiver. It's, it's like that black, that black mirror um, thing, isn't it? Where it's like in the loop, who is the, who is actually the real person and who is the AI created person? Yeah, no, it, 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 for me, it's exciting. It's equal parts exciting and equals parts dystopian <laughs> movie coming round the corner. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I think your your advice about we we as, as a society have to be aware of it, and we, I mean, and we have as much as we can to self police it. Because you're right, the governments are miles behind, uh, and because yeah. even even if, if you look at that Senate example, I'm looking at all those people. Um, and you're thinking, I don't even think you use social media, never mind understand AI. And then you're trying to um, hold the feet or the, yeah, <laughs> the feet to the fire of some of the most intelligent people um, on the planet in regards to digital marketing and AI. And I'm thinking, I think you're a bit outmatched, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. And I think br bringing it back to the business growth aspect, I think that we you you as a business person you have to look at opportunities and yeah. um you have to look at challenges as an opportunity to get ahead and beat the competition and so let's you know let's finish on the high what we're actually seeing here with ai is an amazing set of tools to make our own entrepreneurship business acumen be amplified if we use them in the right way that that's really the opportunity. That's the great thing, um, and and we should we should see that as the, the the thing we should go forward with and say, I'm going to seize this as an opportunity. And I think, uh, Tim, that is a perfect place on which to end. You know, in terms of effectively, you see AI as tools that you can use to amplify your performance. Thank you very much, Tim Butler. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I hope everybody else has enjoyed listening and watching, depending on <laughs> where, where you're um, taking the podcast from. So thank you very much, Tim. Brilliant. Thank you, Hakeem. So that was a great episode, as always, from Tim Butler from Innovation Visual. And what I really like about the episode was he gave some real practical, uh, engaging tips about where to start with AI. So the key takeaways for me from what Tim was saying was number one, always uh, look at efficiency. And then number two, look at um, performance, i.e. look at where are you spending time already? Where are you, your team spending time? And how can you then use uh, or find tools that help you alleviate that? And then on a performance point of view, look at what you're winning at against your competitors and what they're winning at against you. And then look at how you can get tools that fit in that space which will help you bridge that gap and if you want to pick up the show notes head over to the sales acceleration formula.com forward slash podcast hyphen show hyphen notes and you'll be able to subscribe to our mailing list and get show notes for every single episode and as always subscribe like and share with your friends colleagues and anyone else who you think may be interested but most of all keep the feedback coming so that we can continue to improve and give you more of what you like hope you enjoyed this as much as i did and as i always do um, keep listening and keep growing